time. Somebody else said an, uh, ex, ex, uh, anticipation. So it is, it is an expectation of something to come. And so what does waiting like, what does waiting feel like? What does waiting feel like? Sometimes it feels like it takes too long. It makes you anxious. Sometimes you get anxious when you're waiting. You can get nervous when you're waiting, especially if you're waiting for certain things. Have what else? Tired. Tired. Sometimes waiting can make you tired. What else? Upset. And see, it can upset you. Waiting can upset you. Waiting can definitely upset you. It can challenge you. It can do what? It can challenge you. Did I hear somebody say fear? Okay, yeah, fear. So there are, there are a number of things that can happen. It can rob you of your faith. And I, I can see that too. It can definitely rob you of your faith. And so, um, what do you do when you're in a waiting room? You wait, but what are some of the things you do? Somebody say read. What else? You play your games on your phone. I bet you do. And that little music, that little music from your little phone is just playing. I know it is. <laughs> you might read the Bible. You might decide to read the Bible. You can make acquaintances. You can talk to people who are around you. You can sleep. What about when you're, okay, that's if you're in just a regular waiting room, but think about it like this. What would you do if you felt like you were in God's waiting room? Mm. Pray. 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 So I sit back there, pray. What else? Ask him some stuff. You could ask. Praise. So when you're waiting, there are some things that you would do, but then maybe there's some things you would do differently in God's waiting room. I don't know if it's just me. Maybe I'm a conspiracist, uh, but... Uh, Brother Wesley, Brother Wesley, would, have you ever felt like you were in a waiting room and people were watching you in that waiting room? Yeah. Now, you know, I, I have. I felt like, especially if you're applying for a job, sometimes you think they just leave you in there so HR can look at you and see what you do while you're in the waiting room. Sometimes I feel like people are watching you when you're in the waiting room. Do you think that perhaps God is watching you while you're sitting in his waiting room? But there are times when people are observing you to see how you wait. Let me ask you this. Do you think that half and laugh actions work with God? Anybody know what it means to half and laugh? Oh, you don't know that. Well, some of y'all, y'all not as poor as I am. Have you ever paid a bill and you paid half of it and just laughed? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all you can do right there. Not you, but sometimes. You know, sometimes you pay half and you laugh. I mean, that's it. Can you do that with God? No. Because God wants all of it and he wants all of you. You can't just walk in and say, you know, I'm going to give you half and laugh. It's okay. Now think about this, but don't answer it out loud. Just think about it for yourself. What is it that you're waiting for? Just give, just give that a thought. What is it that you are waiting for? What is it that you're waiting for? And so today we're talking about reasons to rejoice. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we did get uh, we did get the system up, and we did crash it. <laughs> so <laughs> we will have to go back to the drawing board in terms of finding out whether or not we can actually get our system to. Uh, to uh, hold the kind of uh, hold the kind of traffic that we put on it today, and uh, the system crashed. So Brother Saunders and I will have to sit down and have a conversation uh, and find out why our system has crashed uh, and what what we can do to uh, fix that. But if we talk about reasons to rejoice and we look at 1 Peter 1, one of the reasons that we can rejoice is because we have, look at that uh, monitor instead of this one. Uh, the reason why, and you could go ahead and change that because the scripture is going to come up, whoever's changing that one on, the, on that far side. One of the reasons we can rejoice is because 
the scriptures tell us that we have uh, we have new birth. This is one of the things that he tells us in 1 Peter. He says that we can praise God, our Father, because he has given us new birth. In this church this morning when we uh, were baptizing, that was new birth. And so we're able to gain new birth. Able to gain new birth. New birth allows us to throw off the old. Did anybody, uh, Kelly, where's my wife? Uh, Reverend Hank, did you, were you able to at least uh, get an account while you were in there? Oh, she's already in the sermon notes. Did anybody actually get an account? You have an account, uh, but you own there already. JC, are you on there already? Okay, is there anybody who's not on there but has an account? You created an account. Brother Danny, would you come over and uh, put your account uh, in here for me and put your password in so that people who don't have it, you should be able to see it on that wall. It, it might be somewhat limited because it's going to be smaller. Uh, but what has happened is with so many of us, on the system at the same time the server, he crashed. And so we had to lock you back out again. And so that's, so for some of you, uh, like my mother-in-law, she probably is on her, uh, what do they call it, 4G or all that kind of thing. Th those folk are all on their Gs. <laughs> their Gs, so they're on their Gs. And so, but uh, you should be able to see it. And then once uh, Brother Danny puts in his, uh, uh, password and his uh, uh, his uh, username is password, you'll see what this looks like uh, when it actually comes up. And uh, I'm not discouraged. I think that many people who have been with us for a while, you recognize that we've tried new technology before. And uh, if I could give you just the, the quick version of this, when I first started as pastor, the new technology that I brought to Liberty Hill, uh, Sister... Sister Carter, you wouldn't believe this, but the new technology that I brought to worship was an overhead projector. <laughs> and I remember Brother Mason, he was yet younger then, but Brother Mason used to change the slides. Our, our hymns would be on the slides, and they'd say, you know, this, this new pastor, he's just, all this technology is just killing me, you know. And then we moved from, the, from that to the overhead to the... Uh, presenters that we're using today and that kind of thing. And so uh, we've been good with this technology. So this is what would come up if you were able to uh, log on. Just click on that one, Brother Danny, that uh, picture that you see there. Click on the picture. If you double click it, it ought to give you exactly that's what comes up. This is what would come up on your slide. And now this is the sermon that I'm preaching right now. Go ahead and, slide and click on that, Brother Danny. You click on the, yeah, double click that. And now he has what I have. And what should happen is that when I change my slide, uh, eventually his slide should change also. It's working. So, uh, oh, I guess because now the system had shut me back out. Okay. So, uh, eventually it'll change. You don't even have to stand there by it. It'll, it'll do the rest. And so, um, when we think about where we've come from, we've come a long way with this, and eventually uh, we will get all the bugs out of it, and then you'll go to church and you'll say, well, I was there when Liberty Hill started this, and now we know why all the other churches are doing it too. But in terms of new birth, if you think about this in verse 1, he's given us new birth into a living hope. There are a couple of things that I want to share with you today because today begins a process of counting. Today begins a process of counting, and in your bulletin notes, I've given you this from Leviticus chapter 23. What God says is, he says, 50 days into the morning of the seventh Sabbath, then present a new grain offering to God. A new grain offering to God. And so what he's telling them is he wants them to count. After the Passover, after 
God delivered them from Egypt. The Passover was over. They've been delivered. And God says, now I want you to count. And I want you to count until the day that I bring you to the law. I'm going to give you the law. I'm going to give you my commandments. I'm going to make you a nation. Because at the Passover, God delivers them. This is the, the you know, the, the, the children of Egypt, they were in uh, bondage. They were uh, in Egypt. The children of Israel were in Egypt. They were in bondage. And while in bondage, they needed to be free. And so God freed them. And many of you may know the story, you know, crossing the Red Sea and all of that kind of thing. He tells them to count because even though they were delivered, they still were not a nation. They were not a people. They didn't have any direction. They didn't have any direction to go on. Now think about this. Sometimes we think that after Resurrection Sunday, it's over. That's it. You know, after Resurrection Sunday, uh, see, it changed. After Resurrection Sunday, it's all over with. And we no longer have to worry about anything else. Matter of fact, says Shannon uh, in the church, a lot of times, preacher when he preaches, uh, at the end of the sermon, he talks about the resurrection and that's it. Jesus rose. And you know, I believe that that's why, Brother Carter, some people are walking around without direction. It's because we get to the cross and we think that's it. We think that's it. There's nothing else after the cross. You know, he rose, and now that's it. And that's why the church seems not to be excited after the resurrection Sunday. I mean, you, you have what we call Easter. That's what they call it. Easter's over, and what do you do next? You wait till Christmas. I mean, what do you do? After Easter, you wait till Christmas. I've always said to this congregation that I think that one of the biggest problems with the church is that we don't celebrate the things that God told us to celebrate. Amen. We celebrate everything else, but because we are oftentimes not students of the word, we don't celebrate it. And so not long ago, and, and I, I enjoyed this feedback. I got this feedback from one of our young people over dinner. So y'all know that was one of my kids. And uh, one of my children told me that uh, sometimes the history is not as exciting. The history is not as, as exciting. And I think that that's right. I think that when you're younger, you know, you don't necessarily want to always hear any history in terms of what has happened in the Bible. And you want to know, well, why is that history important? I'll tell you why the history is important. I'm sharing again with another one of the children at another time eating uh, dinner. I would, yeah, we love to eat. And so I was saying to them that there's a reason why you want to know the history. The reason that you want to know the history is that when you have questions in terms of whether or not God is speaking to you, have you ever had those questions where you wonder whether God was speaking to you or not? There are a lot of voices out there. You know, you know, and, and sometimes you thought you heard from God, and then later on find out you didn't hear from him. The reason that we have those uh, times where we can't figure out whether we talk to God or not is because we don't know the pattern of God. See, if you know the pattern of God, then you know whether or not you're listening to him. You need some confirmation, and that confirmation partially comes through history. Because the more you know about what he did before, the more you'll understand what he's going to do again. I said to someone that if you were to take the time to read, oh, by the way, Brit, Brittany, by the way, when you get him back there, tell him that you hit him once for Papa. This is doing the sermon. That's a mess. <laughs> so uh, when you think about, yeah, you ain't supposed to do that in church. You got to train them up by the young, but they keep on doing that. Now, when you think about the pattern of God and you're listening to God, the more you know the history, the more you'll know that it's God speaking. Right. And so what I said is that if you actually took the time to read the Bible, you started at the beginning and stopped at the end, you will find out that after you read through about the first book, that the next book will be about the same thing 
just in some different words. And the more you read it, the more you will see the pattern of God. The more you see the pattern of God, then the more you understand, you know. So I, the Lord blessed me with this good analogy. Might not be good for some people because they don't like talk about cards, but some of y'all know you play cards, y'all play poker and everything else. But anyway, when they do a magic trick and they lay those cards out there, you know, and they tell you to pick a card. They take a card trick, they take the cards back, and then they tell you, this is your card? And you say, yeah, that's my card. You know that was my card. The way they know that that's your card, because I know something about that particular trick, is they put all of the cards in order. And once they put all the cards in order, then even if they shuffle them, even if they shuffle them, they're still somewhat in order. And so you pull your little card out, you put it back, they look at the pattern, and they realize which card doesn't match the pattern, and then they show you your card. Okay? When we're trying to discover and understand the voice of God, first thing first is put everything in order. Okay. See? And if everything is in order, then when there's something out of the order, you can say, this doesn't belong, and devil, here's your card. That's how it works. And so that's why the history becomes important. The history becomes important so that we understand the pattern of God. And so what did he tell them in Leviticus after the Passover? And the Passover was after he delivered them, he told them, to do a number of things, to remember that he had brought them out. One of the things is that they ate flat bread. The other thing is that they had to slaughter a lamb. And later on, Jesus becomes that lamb, that sacrifice. Okay? He tells them, after the Passover, I need you to count seven weeks. And that'll be seven weeks times seven days. Chelsea, you in that big college. I won't say the name of it. How many days is that? Just 49. Okay, that's 49 days. So that's 49 days. He wanted him to count 49 days. And what he says is he says, I want you to count the Omar or the, this wave offering. And basically what that was is they would go and they would gather uh, the they would gather they would gather the sheaves together and they'd wave them before God. And the Omar is a is a weight. So he wanted them to bring a certain amount every day, and he wanted them to be counting toward when they would go to Sinai and get the law. And that's what he's telling them. And notice in that scripture in Leviticus 25 that uh, he said to speak to them and he said that I give you and ye shall reap the harvest. Notice he said and ye shall reap the harvest. Then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits from the harvest unto the priest. And then he says, you know, he goes on to talk about how they were sacrificing and, and so on and so forth. Well, this whole idea of sacrifice is important. This whole idea of sacrifice is so very important. Because if you were to read the first five books or the first five chapters of Leviticus, which is in the first five books, these five books, this law, is what, or the Torah, this is what God is, is preparing to give them. And so the first five chapters talk about sacrifice. They talk about sacrifice. This is important because some people don't... You know, I'm saying this because there's some people, you left outside of Easter, and there's some of you been in the church all your life, and you figure, you know, when Easter's over, I've been in church all my life, I know what Easter's about. Easter is the fact that they, that he died on the cross, he was buried, you know, crucified, he died on the cross, he's buried, and he rose. And oftentimes, that's all we know. That's all we've been taught. And, and, and perhaps you say, well, that's all I need to know. But that's really not enough. That's not enough. And, he, and here's why. He rose for everybody. He got up out of the grave for everybody. He got up for everybody in this room and everybody on the outside of this room. But now I got something unfortunate to tell you. Everybody is not going to accept him. And everybody is not going to receive a positive eternal reward. Everybody's been given an eternal reward. And that is, you've been given eternity. 
The gift of God is eternal life. However, there's a, there, it comes with something. It, it's got a rider clause on it. And that is the wages of sin is death. And so we've all been given a gift. Now the question is whether or not we know how to receive that gift. And so receiving the gift becomes important. If anybody ever watched uh, Seinfeld, you realize they had the, an episode on the soup Nazi. And he served soup. And Sister Bob was shaking her head. And you had to go in there. And if you didn't go in just right, you didn't get any soup. He had the best soup in town. And when you walked in, he wanted you to walk in quiet. You had to have the right amount of money and all of those kinds of things. And if he didn't like you, he would say, no soup for you today. Get out. Come back tomorrow. And you couldn't get any soup. And so you have to exhibit the right behavior in order to get what you want. And so if we don't know how to get what we wanted, just to say that Jesus rose is really not enough for you. Just because God delivered them from Egypt was not enough. He told them to count. And what he was really saying to them is, I want you to count until connection. Because I brought you out, I did my part. And now I'm going to come back and see if you're willing to do yours. I'm going to bless you some more. This is not all I'm going to do for you. And I need you to get ready to be with me. Okay, maybe we don't get it. Before most guys get married, they go out and they go through some agony of trying to find just the right ring. Okay? They go to try to find just the right ring. And at some point in time, you know, you plan out some romantic something and, you know, you do that. I went to about four or five restaurants before I was trying to figure out which restaurant would be the right restaurant. And all those kind of things. I ended up scrapping that idea all together. I mean, you go through some things trying to figure out what you're going to do in order to propose. And you get down on the one knee and so on and so forth. And you present to her this ring. And when you present this ring to her, Sister Lisa, uh, you're not getting ready to get married right then. The ring is just saying to her that I want to begin the approach. I want to, you know, start the process of getting a little closer. See, when God took them out of Egypt, he was just bringing them forward, but the wedding hadn't taken place yet. Now, I know that's kind of hard for some of us to, to imagine, because there's some folks that do get the horse before the cart, and, you know, but I won't even get into that. But the fact is, there's supposed to be some courtship. And that's what's missing in relationships now, is the whole idea of courtship. Now I'm talking to some of our younger people. You need some courtship. Yes. Because if, if you never have any courtship, if you never have any courtship, I can tell you that your marriage won't work so well. See, but now you not, might not believe me, but anybody in the room has been married for a while. I think the Westerns could tell you. They've been, you've been married for more than 50 years now, right? So the Westerns will be able to tell you that life takes some courtship because at times you get on each other's nerves. And I'm not talking about the Westerns. I'm sure they never get on each other's nerves. But sometimes you get on each other's nerves and what keeps you together is the fact that you can remember the courtship. Oh, I wish I had somebody married in this room that could just attest to the fact that there are times when you got to think back to the courtship to remember how good things were when it started. And so I'm going to stay here because I can remember the courtship. And so he brought them out. And then there was a period of time that kind of lapsed and He told them to count because the marriage hadn't really came about yet. And so they had to count. They had to make sacrifice every day. Sacrifices are important because sacrifices get us closer to God. Sacrifices get us closer to God. I want to give you a quick lesson on sacrifices. Here they go. Now, you're going to need five numbers on your page. One, two, three, four, and five. You want to write down five numbers on your page. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to start with... Uh, 
going to start with me, so I'm going to start at number five. Number five being the low end, number one being the, the far end. And if you want a visual for this, close to number five, draw a little stick figure of yourself. Here I am. I'm at number one. And so I'm at ground zero. I'm at ground zero, Brother Carl. And at ground zero, I recognize that I have trespassed. And a trespass is a little bit different than a sin, okay? Because to sin is to mess up, to trespass is to go too far. You know how you have a lawn sign that says no trespassing? That means that once you have gotten on my lawn, you've gone too far. And so when we trespass, it means that we have gone too far from God. And we've gotten to a place where we're ignoring God. We're not listening to God. We're not even trying. We've trespassed. And we're willfully going against what God has told us to do. We've decided that I'm not going to do what God told me to do. And so in Leviticus, he tells them that when you trespass, when you willfully do against what I've told you to do, that's the act of sin. You're, do, you're actively doing sin, and you're doing it just because you feel like you're big and bad enough to do it. That's trespassing. And he told them that you needed to bring forward a trespass offering. There's an entire chapter. Read chapters 1 through 5 of Leviticus. Entire chapter on that trespass. And so what he tells them is that if you trespass, that you must bring a ram and only a ram. And you've got to sacrifice that. You have to sacrifice it in order to get atonement for your trespass. That's a pretty costly animal, by the way, the ram. Here's the point. Didn't make any difference what the sin was. All the other offerings, it made a difference in terms of what the sin was. With trespass, it wouldn't make any difference if you were a murderer or a thief. The offering was the same to receive atonement. The point is, no matter whether the, what the offense was, the fact is you have gone against God. And because you've gone against God, then atonement must be made. It also says, Brother Danny, that your sin and my sin, I can't say to you, I'm better than you. Because my sin is different than your sin. Oh, see, y'all gonna shoot me down like y'all never heard that before. But oftentimes we try to act like, you know, I don't do as much as you do. And so, you know, you shouldn't look at me like that because my sin is not like your sin. But sin is sin. Because it's not what you did in terms of the action. The action that's important is the fact that you've gone against God. And so, no matter what that is, there's that, that transgression. Okay, so that's number five. Number four is what was called a sin offering. Trespass, you've gone too far. Sin offering was based on the community. It's based on the nature of sin, not the act of sin, but the nature of sin. It is to say that all of us sin. We go to God and we ask God, forgive us because we have the tendency to sin. Hmm. We're not going too far. These are the times when we do something we shouldn't have done and we didn't really mean to or we forgot to do, or we neglected to do what God has asked us to do. You didn't go out and feed the poor like you're supposed to. You know, you, you, you somehow or another cut this guy off while you were driving one morning on your way to work, and you cussing him out. That kind of thing. I dare you to look at me one more time. I dare you to. See, so we have to, we have, to have that sin off of that. And that's the community. Why? Why is it the community? It's because all of us have a, 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 a nature to sin. The trespass off, offering was specific to me. It is about what I did. The sin offering is about what the community does. And the offering varied based on what the person did. Or the persons did. Because again, this is community. These two offerings right here, when you took them to the temple to have them offered by the priest, 
These two offerings are what are called non-sweet savory or non-savory offerings. In other words, God gets no pleasure from those offerings and they are mandatory. In order to get forgiveness and atonement at that time, these were mandatory. They had to be done, but God got no pleasure in them. But I told you there are five offerings in all. Those are the first two. The last three he got pleasure out of because the last three were offerings that were voluntary. So one is trespass, that's me. Two is our community. Three is what we call the peace offering, P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace offering. It's easy to remember this one because it actually uses both words peace. Peace as in uh, the, 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 the condition of our relationship, there's peace in our relationship, and peace as in when you leave this offering, you would get a peace. Because with this offering, one third of it went to the altar to be burnt, and this is how God would get the sweet savor because the smoke would go up into the nostrils of God. So one third of it went to God. One third of it came to the priest. And then another third went to the person who brought it, the worshiper. And what that meant is that God welcomes you at the table and he's forgiving you. You've done the first two. He's forgiven you and he's saying you're welcome at my table. I've accepted you. I accept your prayer. I accept your praise. I accept your worship. Number four, what was called a meat offering, M-E-A-T, meat, but that's not meat like we call it today. It's something lost in translation because the meat offering is actually a grain offering. It is grain that is being brought. It is a grain offering. And this grain offering is a wave offering, meaning that it is waved before God and it is brought in two different ways. There were times when they would bring the actual wheat, they'd bring the stalks and all, and they would wave it before God. Notice in this scripture, he said, bring the stalks and, and wave them. But then there were times where they would take them and they would take the wheat, extract the wheat, they would grind the wheat into fine flour, and they would then add oil, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. They would add salt, a symbol of preservation, and then they would add frankincense so that it would smell, that it would give off a great aroma, and they would mix all of this together to make loaves of bread. And they would make these loaves, and sometimes they would weigh the loaves as it did. And that symbolized that we're willing to work, Lord. We're willing to work. We're willing to work because you had to work to get the harvest. And we appreciate you, God, that you allow us to have harvest when we work. The last one, number one, was a burnt offering, and it's a whole burnt offering, and an animal would be brought forward, and that animal would be burnt in totality. The fat of the animal would go inside, the, the, uh, the meat of the animal would go outside, and they were burnt in two different locations, but they were burnt completely. This symbolizes that when we go to God, that we cannot go to God with everything we have, but we go to God by letting our sin, by letting off the weight that so easily besets us. We don't go into the presence of God with our sin. We go into the presence of God with our life. And so this symbolizes the, the life and the blood. They say, why did you tell us all of that? I got these five things now. I told you that because I need you to understand that our walk with Christ is a process. There are some people that, 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 that usually there are two kinds of people in the church. There are the people who feel like they're, I'm so bad and I'm so terrible. Everything I've done in my life, God doesn't forgive me and nobody really cares about me. And then there's on the other end of that, I am the stuff of God. Okay. I mean, I've done everything right. I've never done anything wrong. And it's a shame about them post sinners I go to church with. I'm trying to save them. And usually we on, we on one end or the other. And what God does is allow us to recognize that it's a process. 
you start this process and sometimes you're at number one. And then you keep on moving and you get closer and closer to God because at that last sacrifice, notice what I said to you, it is a total sacrifice. Everything is given up for God to say, I want to be in relationship with you. I told you all that because what he says in Leviticus when he tells us to count, what he is saying there is that I want you to count because you need to anticipate that I'm going to do more in your life. Hey, come on now. That this is a process. So let me give you some, some other kinds of history here. It began right after Pentecost, uh, right after Passover. And for us, we would say that, and I'm just going to use these terms because it's easier for some of us. We call it Resurrection Sunday here in Liberty Hill, but a lot of people grew up calling it Easter. So let's just call it Easter like that. It starts at Easter, and we count until we get to Pentecost. Starts at Easter, we count till we get to Pentecost. Most everybody has heard of Easter, and some people haven't heard of Pentecost. And if you have heard of Pentecost, it's because it's the Pentecostal church. But now I'm talking about the Pentecost in the Bible, not just any kind of Pentecost. I'm talking about the Pentecost is in the Bible, okay? And so what would happen, seven weeks, they would start right after Passover, and they began to count. Seven weeks afterwards, God came forward, met them on Sinai, and this is where, and I'm putting this all, don't, don't hold me to theological terms, I'm putting it, I'm putting it as simple as I can so that everybody remembers, okay? So we started Easter. We count seven weeks to, to, to uh, a Pentecost. And we're doing that because God told us to count all the way up. Count all the way up. When they get to Sinai, this is when Moses gets the Ten Commandments. If you've been in Liberty here for a long time, you'll know I just got sick saying that. But this is when Moses gets the Ten Commandments. Okay. And uh, this, the Ten Commandments, is what brought them in. Think about it this way. They had a layaway plan. No money down, no interest. 90 days, same as cash. He delivered them and then brought them the terms later. Now, somebody say, well, I think that's just shysty. Why didn't he give them the terms and then deliver them? If any one of you were in prison, and you've been in prison for a while, because they've been in bondage for years. So if, Brother Simon, you're in prison, let's, let's, let's up the ante. you in a Mexican jail. And you've been there. Let's give you five years. You've been there five. And you don't know how many more you're going to pull because they're not even telling you when, you, you know, we're going to take, we take you to trial. And I show up. I'm on the outside. You on the inside. I open the gate and say, come on with me. Are you going to ask me the terms? <laughs> you're not going to ask me the terms. If I'm releasing you, nobody wants to know the terms. You just get me out. And so he got them out. And so, I, Jack, we call that now today the same as cage. He got them out, and when he got them out, we were at a period where the barley harvest had come to its manifestation. So you could get some barley. Barley was then ready to harvest. Barley was ready to harvest. Now, we don't know much about barley because as Americans, we rarely eat barley. We eat wheat. We don't eat barley. And so, Sister Brooks, the reason we don't eat barley, you know why? It's animal food. That's what we feed the cattle. That's what we feed horses. That's what, you know, we don't eat barley. The, the bread is not as, uh, as tasty as the bread that we make with wheat. You can eat barley. Matter of fact, I do eat some barley bread. Sister Brooks is the one that's picking up from it. Well, not no more. <laughs> I'll explain that. She used to be the trustee they would pick up the pot from the, from the certain grocery store, and that trustee would bring me my bread when they pick up the pot to put in the pot machine. And the new trustee, I won't even talk about having bought me no bread. But anyway, 
We'll talk about that later. Barley bread is a little tougher. It's not as good. It's better for you because it's got a little more fiber, but it's not as good as wheat bread. And so the barley was in harvest. And that's what he was telling them when he said, count the Omar. Sister Vicki Williams, he was saying, I want you to go out there, get that barley and bring it in. Get about nine cups of it and bring it in and wave it before me and praise me for the animal food. I want you to go get the animal food and bring it in and praise me for the first harvest. Now, it might not be as tasty. Mm -hmm. It might not be what you want. All right, Pastor. But I want you to come and praise me because I'm letting you know that this is a sign that I'm going to do some more. All right, now. I'm bringing you, I come, I come and I get on my knee and I say, I love you. You're so beautiful. Here's the rain. Will you take my last name? Can we get married? And so when I came and told Sister Kelly that I want to get married, asked to marry me, she said, yes. Now, based on the ring, now the ring, although it was costly, it did not cost me what it's cost me at this particular point to be with her. Okay? At that time, you're thinking that the ring is the expensive part, but what you don't realize is that you're going to really start paying after the wedding. And so when you give her the ring, what she does is she begins to get ready for the wedding based on the ring. All right. Oh, I wish I could get somebody here. She starts getting ready for the wedding, and she about drives you crazy. Anybody that's been married, because then you got to pick out the cake, and you don't care about the cake, you don't care what color the cake going to be. You got to pick out the colors for the wedding. You got to go get your tuxedo and make sure that your, your groomsmen have the right colors on, and the wedding, and the church got to be just right. And then the, and the crying, and I didn't know about this family, why nobody listens to me. And then they got to find the dress, and they can't find the right dress. And then I got to, uh, every woman, she could be the thinnest woman in the world. She's still, I got to lose some weight to get a dress. I mean, and so you go through all of that. She prepares based on the ring. She goes through all of that just based on the ring. Based on the ring, that commitment that we're going to get married. And that's all leading up to the wedding. And so they have the barley. They've been released. He says, I want you to every day just think about this barley because I'm going to do some more. And seven weeks later, the wheat is manifested. All right. And once the wheat is manifested, then they would take, at that time, they wouldn't just wave the wheat. They would take the wheat, crush it, add oil, add salt, make bread. And then they would wave that before God because, hey, we've made it. We've had this anticipation that you're going to do something. Now, as they were counting, there were some things that they went through. Some of y'all know that they went through bitter water. The water wasn't so good. Some of y'all know they went through no water at all while they were doing this. Some of y'all know that they went through uh, a time where uh, they had some war. There were a lot of things going on uh, during the time that, that they were going through this. They went through bitter water. They went from the, the, the manna that came, the stuff they didn't know what it was. Uh, they went through uh, war with the Amalekites. All this time that they were counting. And you know, sometimes when we're waiting on God, when we're sitting in God's waiting room, there are some things that happen, and sometimes we don't have nothing but animal feed to go on. All right now. But we've got to be able to praise God through that yes. in order to get to the manifestation of what he wants yes. to give us. And so you ask me, well, Pastor, why did you tell us all that? It is because as if you read today in the scriptures, you see 1 Corinthians 15, 20, verses 21. It says, but now Christ, Christ risen from the dead and became the what? First. He became the first fruit. And so they would count these 49 days. And once they counted these 49 days, the, 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 on, the, on the 50th day, they would celebrate the harvest of the first fruit, which would begin the Feast of Weeks. This first fruit was only the first fruit of first fruits. Because they would count several weeks, and each week 
they would think about harvest. And there were several things that they would harvest. They would harvest barley, wheat, pomegranates, figs. They harvested grapes. They harvested uh, uh, dates. And they harvested olives. And they would always bring the first of that to God. This wheat was the first of the first for celebration. The Bible says that Christ is the first fruit. Because, yes, there was Easter. But if we count 49 days, seven weeks from today, seven weeks from today will be June the 8th. Seven weeks from today. And so we've already gone through Easter. And here we are on this Sunday. Different people count in different ways. And somebody looking at me, well, why didn't we start counting last week? That's just how we do it. We celebrate it by counting beginning this week. And so we count this week, and we count seven weeks. We count seven weeks, and, you know, we get excited about Christmas. People got these little count 25 days to Christmas. As soon as they get in December, 25 days to Christmas. And I know some of y'all got the actual ones that's been made out of cloth and has a little doors, and you open the little doors, and there's stuff behind each one, a partridge and a pear tree and all of that, and y'all put it back in the box every year, or you buy the little paper ones, or you get a calendar and you mark it off. You got 25 days to Christmas. I just wonder how many people are in anticipation of the Pentecost. How many people recognize that, yeah, he rose, he died for us, he shed his blood, but he delivered the, the Israelites and he brought them out of bondage. He led them to a place where he gave them the law. You say, well, what do we get? After Christ died, he rose on the third day morning, and then guess what? Here's something that a lot of people don't know, little known fact. He stuck around for 49 more days. Yes, yes. A lot of people think that he actually got about the grave and was like, see y'all, splits, and just right up. Huh. He actually stayed around for 49 days after Easter. Now Jasmine Brooks is looking at me like, why didn't they tell me that in Sunday school? I <laughs> So 49 days. He stuck, he stuck around for a while and he did some ministry. And then finally he left. And when he left, he gave us something that's very important. Go ahead and put all the points up because I'm not going to get to all of them today. I'm going to briefly and quickly, as I run to water clothes, tie all this up so that you'll understand exactly what I'm saying to you. I'm saying to you, point number one, here we go. We're going to go pretty quickly and I'm going to be done in about, this is the five minute version. Y'all ready? Okay, because all this will make sense to you by the time I finish. We have new birth. We have new birth. Remember he said that he's given us new birth. Christ is the first fruit. In Acts chapter 1, it says that John baptized you with water, but you've been baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Many days. Counting days. Remember? Counting days. You've been baptized, and then the Holy Ghost baptized. You've been baptized with water, and then you've been baptized by the Holy Ghost. Do you remember I said that they brought him out the Red Sea? They brought them out the Red Sea. Well, when they went through the Red Sea, what did they do? Didn't they go down into the water, but they didn't get wet? They was in the water, so the whole nation got baptized that day. They went through the water. Significant. Brother Tracy said, hmm, okay, Pastor, you really showing me some stuff. Then the whole nation went down through the water. They were all baptized simultaneously. But they had not, even though they had been baptized, you know when, if I gave Brother Saunders that deal and I took him out of that prison after five years, he is not going to stop right then to think about, oh my goodness, I've just been saved. I need to thank this man. And I need, let's, let's stop right here and let me give a proclamation. No, he's going to run. And later on, we're going to talk about the details. But right then, all you're thinking about is getting away. They got away. They went through the Red Sea. It wasn't significant right then. Wasn't nobody stopping to take pictures. Now, you, you can imagine somebody running through the Red Sea. Hey, wait a minute. Is that a whale? <laughs> you know? No. They were running. I mean, we think of that as miraculous, but wasn't nobody stopping. I mean, of course it was miraculous. And I'm sure they were in awe, but nobody was stopping to get the details. 
all they know is, hey, Lord is, is blessing us. So they were baptized simultaneously going through the water. But the covenant had not yet been made. When we are baptized, a lot of times we're going through some stuff. We come to God and we say, I'm ready to surrender my life. We get baptized. But then we don't really think of the full weight of that. It takes some time for us to really get connected with the Holy Spirit, whereby we're then being led. And so you have been born again. You can be happy about that. But then your inheritance is incorruptible. So not only have you been born, you've been born into a family where you can't lose. Now, I don't know about y'all. I love my family to death. I love my, I love my dad. I love my mom. However, when my father died, we were broke. When he lived, we were doing pretty good. My daddy had a decent job. He had built a house that he was uh, buying. He had a luxury car, a couple of luxury cars, business and all of that. Before he died, I can't even remember what old car we had. Mama was trying to figure out how to pay what he had lent. My family inheritance was not incorruptible. It was certainly corruptible. See, some of you, you're looking at your mom and daddy now, my kids probably lick their chops every time they see me, just waiting on me to die. And I really believe one of them grandchildren of mine just looks at me like, when's he going to die? <laughs> but they don't know before I leave here, I might not have nothing left. You don't know what's left to you. You might think that you're going to get a whole bunch. Sometimes even when you think your folks got something, they leave and you find out they didn't have nothing. But what God does for us is that when we're born into his family, our relationship with him and our inheritance is incorruptible. That's why he had them to add the salt to the bread in Leviticus 2. It's because it symbolizes the preservation, the incorruptible. And so then we are incorruptible in our inheritance, but then we are shielded. We are shielded. In verse 5, he says, uh, who through faith are shielded by God's power. He said, our inheritance would never perish or spoil or, or fade. It's kept in heaven for you. But then your faith is shielded by God's power. In John chapter 14, he says, uh, you know, when I leave, I'll send you a confidant, another confidant. Do you know, I, I've read the Bible before, but there's times when things just pop out at you, Aunt Jack. I had to put that word in bold, another. See, sometimes we say he will send you a confidant. But Sister Lisa, that's not what he said. He said, I'll send you another confidant. So that means you already had one, and all I'm doing is replacing. In other words, the Lord has never left us unprotected. That's the kind of God we serve. And so this wasn't just the first. He says, I'm going to send you another. He said, the world wouldn't be able to receive you because they don't know you. But you know what? I will not leave you confidence. He said, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me because I live. Ye shall live also. Remember, not many days hence. He said in Acts, in Acts 1 where I showed you, you're baptized and not many days hence the Holy Spirit come. Notice he says a little while you won't see me. They won't know who I am or where I am, but you'll see me. See, that. notice that you've got barley for a little while. You might have that animal feed for a little while. And the world might not understand why you're going so crazy and enjoying the animal feed. But it is because there's something that they can't see that you see. Yeah. Once you see the hand of God working in your life, you no longer have to worry about what he's bringing in that hand. Because as long as his hand is working, you know that it will get better and better. And so he knows that God's hand is working. And sometimes when you troubleshoot, they'll tell you at the cable company, they'll say, turn on the TV. What do you see? Well, it keeps on saying uh, 
It keeps on uh, at the same channel, and I can't change the channel, and I can't hear nothing. Okay, well, that must mean we're getting a signal. Hold on, I'm going to send a signal to the, I'm going to try to signal the box. And you're so happy if you got cable and you ever had cable go out. You're so happy when that man come back on there and say, well, I signaled the box, and I got a signal back. Now, you know if they don't get a signal back, that means they got to send a technician. But as long as they get a signal back, they say we can work with you. And they'll keep on sending signals, and then sometimes they'll even tell you, sister, another, they'll say, unplug it, and plug it back in. And do you know that sometimes life seems like you got to unplug it for a minute? Yeah. And, and it seems like your service is cut off. But as long as you know that you can receive a signal, then that means when the service comes back on, then he's still going to be there. And that's what he's saying. I'm not just sending you a comment. I'm sending you another comment. And so you are shielded because he's not going to leave you. But then your life has purpose. So, okay, here we go. Pentecost. I'm going to explain it to you real quick. Easter, 49 days later, Pentecost. Or 50 days. 49 days later, Jesus left. When Jesus rises, he is the first fruit of humanity. He's the first one to rise. First one to rise. And what, after he rose, the angels came out there and said, why y'all still looking up in there? They just looking up in the air. It was almost like they were waiting on him to come back. He said, don't just look up in the air. Go over there and pray. They went and they got them an upper room. And the upper room was very significant. I can preach that sermon later, but Basically, when you're threshing wheat, you had to take it up high so that the wind could pass by in order to take the bad stuff away and leave the good stuff. And so they went up there at the time of Pentecost, the time of harvest, and they went up there and they started praying. Yeah. And they touched and agreed. And you know, as they were praying, what happens is like a mighty rushing wind, the Holy Spirit comes through the room. And what the Bible says there in Acts, it says that uh, there were some infallible proofs. In other words, what God has already done is infallible. He's already showed you the bond. Okay. But then he said, just wait on the promise of the Father. Just count the days. And then he says, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come unto you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so you know what? You've got purpose. He said, the, the writer says that you can rejoice because you, you're going to end up being greater than God. Right now. He says you can rejoice because the power of God is coming. Yeah. That's what they were counting about. They saw Jesus rise, but they didn't have the power yet. He says when the Holy Ghost comes, you will have power. Yeah. God told them when you get the law, you're going to be found. You're going to be a nation. You're going to finally be mine. When you get the Holy Ghost, when you get the Holy Spirit, I've gone to some churches, and you know what? I could say that I'm not knocking it, but I guess I am, because I've never seen it in the Bible that way. I've gone to some churches, and they say, well, we're going to take you back in this little room. I said, what are they taking back in the little room for? They said they got to go back there and tarry until they get the Holy Ghost and start speaking in tongues. And they come back out and they say, we tarried, we prayed with them. They got the Holy Ghost and now they're speaking in tongues. I've seen some of the hellish, most hellish folk I ever met speaking tongues. I wish they could carry some of them heathens back in the room and pray for them and get them to come out living right. Because if they really get or catch the Holy Ghost, as they call them, rather than start shouting, They'll come out speaking and living the truth. Because what the Bible says is that I'll send you the comforter, I will send you the Holy Spirit, and he will lead you and guide you in all truth. There are some things that I have not told you yet, but if you just wait, the Holy Spirit will reveal these things through Christ Jesus. He will not speak of himself, but he's going to speak through Christ Jesus. That's why I told you, you got to know some history. Because when you know some history, then you're able to say that, yes, 
I might be holding on to some barley today, but the faith that I have allows me to know that the wheat harvest shall come. Yeah. And so once the harvest has come, it is an indication that God is going to continue to bless me yeah. Yeah. to the seasons yeah. of my life. And so then I know that I've been born again. I know that my inheritance is incorruptible. I know that I have purpose. But then I recognize that I can see the end. And seeing the end is very important because oftentimes when we can't see the end, that's when we begin to live faithless. The world doesn't know it. The world doesn't seem like we see it. But you can know the end because you have the Holy Spirit guiding you. And so what do we do in this season? <coughs> this is a time to count. It is a time unlike those 25 days of Christmas. Because when you count down them 25 days of Christmas, let's be honest, Sister Allen, we're not counting 25 days trying to figure out what God is going to do. We're counting 25 days to try to figure out what somebody is going to do for us. And we're dropping hints here and there. You know, I saw this tie over at Macy's. It really was not. You know, I was just thinking that maybe this year uh, we could get a new this or a new that. And you count down because you want to know in 25 days, will I be able to open that box and see that new tie, those new socks, or that new ring, or that new watch? What will I be able to get? Am I going to get those new boots in that? I'm counting down my 25 days. But let me tell you for the real worshiper who has truly read your Bible, then you will understand that this is the time where you ought to be remembering the count. Yes. You ought to be remembering the count. I'm not counting for the first time. I'm just remembering the count. Because I've been through the count before. And I know the count has already been taken because Jesus died and he rose. He rose from the grave, but then he rose from the earth. And so you say, well, why did you tell us about those sacrifices? Because those sacrifices, when they went on the altar, the smoke went up from the altar and it went into the nostrils of God. Yeah. 